want to say to you directly, and for the record, that I do not lead a cult. It, it's a weird one because it doesn't look or act like a regular cult in a lot of senses. Like, it is a cult. And she would basically tell like her followers to, if there's like toxic people in your life that are like adding to your stress and they don't, are they, they're like not aligning with your vibration. They're like low vibration and you're like trying to become spiritual and be more high vibration. You need to cut those people out, which is like a cult tactic. She does not have any formal education in mental health counseling. When she was challenged about her educational level, she said that her question to anybody would be, if you went back in time and sat at the foot of Albert Einstein, would you ask him for his credentials? As a clinician with a license who currently practices psychotherapy and who's, you know, because of the, the licensing board and, and the regulatory bodies that come along with being a practicing psychotherapist, I'm held to a pretty high standard in terms of minimum standards of care. I feel compelled to speak about these things because there is the potential for a lot of hurt and a lot of further trauma. And so I want to talk about this from that perspective. She made a controversial statement suggesting that there was nothing wrong with ending one's life. She referred to suicide as a reset button. And implying that Leslie's death was Teal's failure, no matter how vague and indirect you think you're being, is cruel. The Teal Swan they created in this episode makes me come across very hard, harsh, cold, dismissive, unworkable, domineering, competitive, and angry. So why do people hate her so, 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 so much? It's more comfortable when you're someone like Teal to think that everyone's speaking out against you because they hate you personally than to admit or to begin to recognize that the things that people are saying may just be because you're talking absolute fill in the blank. Is she trying to fool people or does she really believe everything that she says? There's no way to hold her accountable because in her mind she knows everything and she's above everything so every decision that she makes is the correct decision and it's the appropriate decision and so if you are challenging her decision you are going against her ultimate spiritual goal of like saving humanity and you need to be cut out. These are people, myself included, who needed support, needed help, needed professional help, <laughs> needed um, a therapist who was trained and qualified. She claims to be special in many ways. She claims to have extrasensory perception. She can see into the future, perceive beings in spiritual realms, travel out of her body, and read people's minds. She says that she is clairvoyant, clairaudient, clairsentient. She has also claimed that she is an alien from uh, the star Arcturus. She's claimed that she is an Indian guru reincarnated. She's made lots of statements about her identity and herself, but generally Teal is this very like larger than life personality who's made a name for herself on YouTube and the internet generally for speaking about trauma, for speaking about self-improvement, for speaking about like mental health and wellness generally. Something that's really important for us to note here though is one of the things that Teal is not, which is a licensed psychotherapist, um, a counselor, anyone <laughs> with any level of formal training in counseling, therapy, psychotherapy, life coaching, um, any and not all of those things, no credentialing or training in those areas. More than a year, I've gotten requests to cover a certain self-help influencer by the name of Turquoise Duck. This channel often goes very hard against self-help authors and influencers, especially those who attempt to practice unlicensed therapy on vulnerable people. However, today's subject, Cerulean Fowl, claims to be not like other self-help influencers. She believes that she truly has the powers and the answers that we're seeking, and genuinely hopes that her practices will one day become part of mainstream therapy, especially her signature therapy program titled 
The Completion Process, which shares a name with one of her most well-known self-help books. During the past few years, Grey Goose has faced a large amount of criticism for her practices. One of her most controversial claims is her likening of the process of ending your own life to something of a reset button. In 2012, she faced the largest controversy of her career when one of her former clients, a woman named Leslie, actually did take her own life after following her teachings. Since then, tons of former fans and followers of Red Robin have shared their stories online, speaking about experiences that they felt were cult-like. In the past few weeks, this discussion has once again resurfaced to the mainstream. A docu-series produced by Freeform titled The Deep End premiered on May 18th, 2022. This documentary aimed to examine the question of whether or not this self-help influencer is, in fact, stepping over that line into becoming a cult leader. Today's video is about Teal Swan. That one's actually her name. Get you some nuts. There was lots of memes makes me wonder if I should pick up lesbianism. Chicago. You guys asked for it. What's up, my fellow small business supporters? I'm Savvy, and welcome back to Savvy Writes Books, the channel where we talk about books and business, and that often involves reviewing self-help books and discussing the business practices of many self-help influencers, one of which is the subject of today's video, Teal Swan. But before we dive into the deep end of this very long, very emotional video, Let's have a quick word from today's sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by Magic Spoon, a high protein cereal that I've been eating and loving for months now. 2022 has been a really busy year for me. As you may have noticed, I've increased the frequency of my YouTube uploads, plus I'm currently in the process of launching a new character for my small business, Forever Home Friends. Combine that with the fact that I'm working on a couple new books right now, and yeah, I haven't had a ton of time for figuring out my meals and cooking meals every day. But for the past few months, I haven't really had to worry about breakfast. Magic Spoon cereal has basically become a staple each day, and it always makes me feel energized to tackle my workday ahead. Ever since I started eating Magic Spoon cereal, in January, my favorite flavor has been the cinnamon one, although the fruity flavor is a close second, and I've been loving the maple waffle and cookies and cream flavors as well. Guys, I just really like cereal. Magic Spoon cereals have zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs per serving. Each cereal has zero grams of sugar per serving other than the honey nut flavor, which has one gram of sugar per serving because of the real honey they use to make it. Each serving only has about 140 calories as well, and these cereals are keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and low-carb. So click on my link below to get some Magic Spoon cereal. You can build your very own variety box and use my code SAVVY for $5 off. You can choose from some of the best-selling flavors, including cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, cookies and cream, maple waffle, blueberry muffin, and cinnamon roll. Magic Spoon has also recently added the honey nut flavor to their permanent collection, and guys, it's delicious, so you can check out that one for your box as well. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's back with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund you your money, no questions asked. So click the link below and use my code SAVVY for $5 off or go to magicspoon.com SAVVY to save $5 on your order today. And be sure to check out that new honey nut flavor if you're interested in that one, guys. And if you guys are in Canada or in the UK, Magic Spoon cereals are now shipping there as well as to the US. Thank you to Magic Spoon for sponsoring this video. Hope you guys enjoy it. Part one, who is Teal Swan. Teal Swan is a self-proclaimed spiritual teacher and self-help author. Much like Tony Robbins and many of the others that we've covered on this channel, she leads self-help seminars where participants can come ask her questions live on stage. She also hosts retreats for the purpose of spiritual healing. Teal Swan was born in 1984 in New Mexico, but spent most of her childhood and then subsequent adulthood in Utah. This will become important later. Teal claims to have been born with a variety of extrasensory powers. She claims to experience clairvoyance, clairsentience, and clairaudience. We'll delve deeper into the recent docu-series The Deep End in parts four and five of this video, but the documentary did give an overview of what Teal's childhood and childhood trauma was like, so I did want to cite that as a source here. According to the documentary, Teal claims that she began experiencing these powers or extrasensory abilities as a child, and as a result, her parents didn't really know how to handle her. She says that her mother was afraid of her because Teal, in her own words, saw other dimensions, read minds, 
mines and saw dead people. Her parents began to fear that she was cursed in some way. She went to multiple therapists and psychologists where she received a plethora of mental illness diagnoses, including schizophrenia. But according to Teal, nothing that traditional therapy had to offer could help her. Teal then continues to tell her story of how, when she was six years old, her family met an alternative practitioner who said he could help her out on the weekends. He was an adult man, over 60 years old, and Teal, a young child, went to spend time alone with him. Teal then recounts how in 1990, when she was six, he began abusing her in multiple ways, including many instances of S.A. She claims that she was forcibly placed under the influence by him and S.A.'d as well as tortured in other physical ways. As a result of that abuse, Teal attempted to take her own life when she was 17 years old. At the age of 19, after 13 years of abuse, Teal finally broke free from her abuser and went to live in the house of her friend Blake, with whom she soon started a romantic relationship. After a year, the two broke up but chose to stay friends and continued living together for the next 16 years, even as they both had relationships and even marriages with other people. And I do quickly want to give a bit of commentary on this part. While I'll review the documentary more in depth later in the video, I do want to say that I thought this was a little manipulative that the series tried to paint Teal and Blake's relationship as weird or wrong just because they continued a platonic life partnership after breaking up in the romantic sense. I think the assumption that men and women should only live together in a romantic capacity or else it's scandalous, well, that also kind of stems from purity culture, which is another form of manipulation against women. And there's nothing wrong with having an ex as a roommate or a best friend, even if you're in a relationship with someone else, as long as all parties involved are comfortable with the relationship and consent to it. We're going to delve more into the nuances of this situation later, but I do think that implying that them having this type of relationship on its own in a vacuum, that implying that that was a red flag in some way, I thought that did show a little bit of bias on the part of the documentary. However, let's get back to the main elephant in the room here, which is the horrific abuse that Teal suffered as a child and a teenager. In the 2000s, teen therapist Barbara Snow, who helped her uncover her repressed memories, We'll talk about Barbara Snow in a moment. Because Teal was able to begin healing after uncovering repressed memories, she made repressed memory therapy a cornerstone of her self-help and spiritual work. This has been controversial for a lot of reasons. Repressed memory theory is generally not well liked or like smiled upon by a lot of folks in the clinical world because it's very controversial for a number of different reasons. The first of which is that it is not enough of an evidence-based practice. The APA, for example, the American Psychological Association, um, has not condemned repressed memory therapy, but has also chosen to not endorse repressed memory therapy on the basis that it, it cannot be proven with like randomized controlled trial and like robust research to be not harmful. This is a very difficult thing to study. The research in this area is very tenuous and it's a very difficult thing for us to prove whether it's real or not, because we do have research to reliably um, and like without a doubt prove that the human brain works in such a way that we can absolutely implant memories in people's brains on accident or on purpose. This can very much happen as the result of bias, as the result of suggestion, um, and this is especially scary when we think about the power imbalance that exists in traditional psychotherapy. The issue is not with uh, whether it's possible for people to forget things, because we do know from research that dissociation is a real thing, that dissociative amnesia is a real thing, that it is very much possible for the brain to do sort of wonky things with memory, but because of the way that the therapy seeks to try to recover the memory. We have research to support the idea that it is very much possible and has very much happened uh, that therapists can accidentally implant or on purpose implant memories. The reason that this is dangerous is because we can't verify after the fact uh, when a, a client has stated, you know, I've recovered these memories during the psychotherapy. We can't verify whether those memories have been implanted as a result of bias or whether they're genuine memories. In addition, therapists like Barbara Snow using techniques like repressed memory therapy is speculated to have been connected to the satanic panic of the 1990s. Satanic panic, a conspiracy theory, was a moral panic movement meant to return to Christianity or else we couldn't save the children from the satanic influence. The fact that Teal was experiencing all of this in Utah, a state with heavy Mormon influence, may also be connected to this whole mess. I received an email from one of my viewers who had a lot of insight to share on the connections between Mormonism, satanic panic, and Teal's former therapist Barbara Snow. This email 
comes from a woman named Teresa who goes by the name Body Loyalty on TikTok. She's a Mormon feminist doing work to bring light to the SA and abuse that women in Mormon communities often feel and to make the Mormon church overall more friendly and equitable to women. Here's the email she sent me. Hi, Savvy. I'm excited to talk to you about all this deeply grim stuff. This shit is so nuanced and the stakes are so high, it is extremely difficult to do justice, so I thought I'd lay out some bullet points. Satanic Panic was a false moral panic that was a national Darvo reaction to the emergence of CSA, child SA, awareness, particularly around church abuse scandals. Barbara Snow did untold damage to survivors by implanting false memories. And also, I believe Teal Swan experienced extreme ritualized abuse. Her story is consistent with hundreds of survivors I've spoken with over my 25 years as a Mormon feminist community organizer dealing with gender and SA violence. Mormons have not had our spotlight moment like the Catholics. The public does not know yet how widespread abuse is in the church or the nature of that abuse, and neither do other members. So you will probably get comments saying I'm not accurately representing the church, but it's because survivors aren't disclosing to those people. Mormon life is very ritualized prayers before dinner and basketball games, family home evening on Monday nights with a full opening program. The temple is nothing but rituals. And they call the nuclear heterosexual family the building block of eternity, with the father as the patriarch and leader. Women and children are subservient to that hierarchy. It's a situation that breeds abuse. Abuse typically occurs most often in families, and the highly ritualized church turns families into a unit of heaven. So that means if you have abusers using religiously themed rituals and their abuse to retain control and discredit the victim, and victims taught from the time they were small that this is how it should be. Abuse is so normalized in our culture that to a lot of people it just seems like the logical next step. They don't know it when they see it. They just feel the suffering and believe they are weak for it. NLP, hypnosis, and visualizations are a common feature of this abuse. In my opinion, this is the source of the truly graphic body horror accusations. You take a five-year-old with an undeveloped brain in an environment of terror where trusted adults are showing or describing graphic imagery and claiming it's real. Why would they believe it wasn't? So you get someone like Teal Swan, who experienced extreme ritualized abuse that no one believes is real, but she's living with the trauma that says otherwise. She goes to a therapist who commits malpractice and only makes the problem worse. Government, media, law enforcement all line up to protect the image of the church. Trauma therapy doesn't exist yet, even if you could get someone to believe you. During those years, most of us just suffered, carrying the weight of it all privately and doing our best to spiritually bypass it all. It created her, and it continues to create her audience. If she was the only one with this story, it wouldn't be credible. But she's not. I have personally spoken with hundreds of survivors who all have very similar accounts. I think she is using those same techniques she experienced through abuse in her videos and teachings. She is using hypnosis techniques in the production choices, she, particularly her speech patterns, pitch, and rhythm. She uses visualization in really destructive ways. All the evil shit she does, she learned, and she's passing it on. The survivors of this kind of abuse are really in a terrible position, discredited by the specter of satanic panic, but unable to blow the whistle on church sex scandals because the nature of the abuse discredits the victim. I think the only thing that's going to change is when Utah's population reaches a tipping point of non-Mormons so that the church can't control all the systems that might intervene or provide accountability. Thank you so much to Teresa for sending me that email and providing me with all of that context about that element and of life in Utah and what that type of setting is like. I greatly appreciate that. Guys, go ahead and check out Teresa and her work on TikTok. I linked it in the description below. While repressed memory therapy is controversial, during this video, I'm going to treat Teal's allegations of abuse as legitimate. I think it's a good practice to listen to victims when they open up about these things, and it makes a lot of sense that abuse could have played a role in influencing Teal to become this type of spiritual leader. However, just because certain healing techniques have worked for Teal herself, does not necessarily mean that she has the authority to impose those techniques on others, especially since therapy is such an individualized process. However, there's no denying that Teal Swan has quite a strong fan base, with over 1 million subscribers on YouTube and thousands of people buying her books, paying to attend her seminars, and going to her retreats. So let's move into part two. What do Teal's fans see in her? 
In preparation for this video, I spoke to a few of Teal's former followers. The week before this video comes out, we had just finished a week delving into Teal Swan on my second channel, Your Morning Guru, which is my daily morning live show diving deep into the lives of business and self-help gurus. When we focused on Teal, a few of her former fans told us that they were interested in sharing their stories with us. So I'm now going to share both of those interviews with you. Kelsey, I want to hear about your experience being uh, involved with uh, the the teal swan world, mm -hmm. how did you how did you first hear about her? What drew you into this, and like what was the extent of your involvement? Uh, yeah, so I just get so excited that people are talking about her um, mm -hmm. because for a long time the only voices online about her were positive voices, her followers, yeah. and she started online, so there was really no other information about her. She was sort of like a YouTube guru. Mm -hmm. I started following her maybe 10 years ago. So I was, I was like mm, 22 or 23. Mm -hmm. And I had just gotten diagnosed with a chronic illness. And I didn't know. I was just kind of in a dark place mentally. Like I was like, there's no certain treatment methods. There's no, I was getting a lot of like medical gaslighting as a female, uh, you know, seeking <laughs> treatment for a chronic illness and, yeah that happens a lot yeah. yeah and so I was into like meditation and things like that and trying alternative treatments like going to naturopathic doctors and just really trying to find anything to help me reclaim like a sense of control over my life I guess you could say mm -hmm. and I had been watching a lot of different YouTube videos um, about other people who had similar diagnoses and she had started with a series called Ask Teal on her YouTube channel and it was one of the ones that got recommended to me because she had really just started with spiritual questions right so people could ask her different spiritual questions or questions about like <laughs> depression or anxiety or kind of like anything like that. And it was a really, I thought that her content was like a really interesting perspective as someone who um, loosely grew up in like a Christian uh, background, but wasn't a practicing Christian yeah. anymore and was in a dark spot and sort of looking for any sort of reason for, well, why am I going through this? Why me? You know, that sort of, uh, young and not understanding what was going on in my life. And so I started really following her Ask Teal series. And I think what was really interesting about her is she sort of provided versus like some other self-help people was like, she would give like tips like, okay, so if you are like going through a panic attack, you need to do X, Y, Z versus some other self-help people would just be like, <laughs> Oh, try and meditate more. Like they weren't very like specific. They mm -hmm. were very vague. And she would always give like very specific uh, ways to deal with things. And I read two of her books. I read um, The Sculptor in the Sky and Shadows Before Dawn. And I was also re really into like shadow work and kind of like trying to understand the trauma that I was going through with mm -hmm. managing my chronic illness and things like that. And as I got a, a couple years into her work is when she kind of shifted and as she started talking more about like her views about mental health treatment were basically like, if you are on any medication, you should not like the goal is to not be on any medication, right? Oh, wow. That, that's yeah. her goal. Like, yeah. I don't want you on any medication for mental health treatment. I don't want anybody on any medication for any physical ailments. And uh, you should be eating like a raw vegan diet and foods have different vibrations. So if you're eating Oh, meat, no. Yes. My other red flag as someone with anxiety and depression who needs to be on some sort of medication when she started saying like, I don't want, like the, the reason people have mental illnesses, even if it's uh, an anxiety disorder. So she would sort of lump them all in the same, like mm -hmm. schizophrenia and anxiety disorder, any sort of mental disorder, or mental illness. She would start, she started preaching it as like the reason that you have that is because you never felt safe as a child. And it was never like, oh, this is a legitimate illness that needs treatment for a yeah. lot of people. And you should go to therapy. She was very like against therapy because the mental health professions are like, they totally get everything wrong. And so she was like very against therapy and very against like 
being on medication. And as someone who that's very helpful for, yeah, <laughs> I was like, um, okay. So then I started feeling a lot of this like internalized guilt of like, cause she's also like a law of attraction practitioner. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. I started believing basically the reason that I was sick was because I thought something about myself, right? Like I attracted the illness. She's is... teaching everyone that we manifest our illnesses. Yes. <laughs> this yes, is horrible. Yeah. yeah. And so then I would be like, well, I need to like really watch my thoughts because I, I attracted this illness and I need to watch what I'm thinking. I don't want to attract anything else negative. And if you have anxiety or something like that, it's like you get random intrusive thoughts. Oh my lot. God. Yeah. Yeah. And so then it became, I started realizing as I like actually went to real therapy, like, oh, this is very detrimental. It's a very detrimental belief system. So it was very, like, I kind of started like waking up and that around that time is when she started the Teal Tribe Facebook group, which I was part of. And it was a lot of like very sort of lost people, which was the state that I was in when I found her looking for some sort of sense of community and belonging. And I think wanting to feel seen and feel heard and coming from a variety of different traumas and different backgrounds and um, in the documentary, they talk about there are a couple of people from her Facebook group who ended their own lives. And a lot of it had to do with like the comments that they were getting in that Facebook group and her beliefs around death as being like a reset button and stuff. So that was around the time that I started pulling away and she built her like compound in Costa Rica I think it's called Philia or something where she does retreats and stuff mm -hmm. and you could really see like okay so there was like a certain group of people that were always kind of in some of her videos too and you started realizing like oh the, that's like the beginning of the cult and that was her community and she would basically tell like her followers to if there's like toxic people in your life that are like adding to your stress and they don't are they, they're like not aligning with your vibration. They're like low vibration and you're like trying to become spiritual and be more high vibration. You need to cut those people out, which is like a cult tactic, right? right. Like, it's isolate you yeah. from your friends and family so yes. that I'm the only person whose information you're getting. Yes, yeah. exactly. And I think when I was young in my twenties and I was dealing with a lot of stuff, there were years where it's like, I just wouldn't talk to family members. Cause I'd be like, oh, well, they just don't get it or whatever. Mm -hmm. And now in my thir early 30s, I have a totally different approach to like accepting people for who they are. And it, it doesn't have anything to do with like they're lower than me and I'm better than them. And, you know, it's just yeah. a totally, it's a more healthy environment. And the relationships that I have with like my friends and my family are so much healthier now because I left that viewpoint and that idea that like, you should only hang out with people who vibrate at your level or are interested in spiritual things. When I read the shadows before dawn, that was kind of like a wake up call because there was one part, she gives different specific action items for like how to practice self love. And one mm -hmm. of them was in the morning, like, okay, it would be like, okay, so grab your water in the morning and like, hold on to it. All right, and, I've got my water. Yeah, and think about how much you love, like, just in, like, think about love and put that energy into the water and then drink the water and then you're going to love yourself. Like, put that, love that's going to, yeah, that's going to, like, transfer that vibration in the water is going to transfer into you and then you're going to start loving yourself. She has these drawings, they're, like, uh, sacred geometry and it would basically be, like, buy my drawings and, like, focus on the drawing and it'll, like, heal your ailment or whatever, like, the mm -hmm. geometry of the drawing and she used to pay to have them put on billboards. She, I remember one time she was, like, I've got these billboards in Detroit and it's going to heal Detroit and I was, like, oh my gosh, like, she just is... I understand. Right, been waiting for a right. jail swan billboard. All yeah, these like years. that. That's gonna solve it. Yeah. So it's just she's very predatory, and I think she, and she, as someone who followed her from the beginning to now, she does believe that she is like a ascended being. If people will challenge her, she'll or like try and hold her accountable for her behavior. She'll basically just kind of 
there's no way to hold her accountable because in her mind, she knows everything and she's above everything. So every decision that she makes is the correct decision and it's the appropriate decision. And so if you are challenging her decision, you are going against her ultimate spiritual goal of like saving humanity and you need to be cut out. She's very ableist too. Like she did an interview with Someone who had a lot of physical disabilities, I remember, and this was another red flag. <laughs> and she mm-hmm. like told, basically told him in the interview, like, well, if you no longer needed your physical disabilities anymore to like um, learn what your soul needs to learn in this lifetime, they would just disappear and you wouldn't have them anymore. I, I have a sibling, an older sibling who has disabilities. And I was like, no, 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 no. Like that was another huge, like, absolutely not. And so she's like super ableist. She's like, Uh, asserts this belief that we all like have a soul contract and like choose our traumas that we're going to experience in this lifetime, like before we're born. So I was, it was all like a slow burn of like all of the red flags and just being like, wait, like this is not healthy what she's saying to people and it's actually dangerous. Hello. So we're here today to talk about your experiences being a fan of Teal Swan in the past, being a part of the Teal tribe. Uh, to start off, can you just kind of go over like what your what your involvement was with her overall fandom? Sure, absolutely. I think it's a common question that I get um, now that I'm no longer following Teal. Um, like, why did I even choose to follow her in the first place? I get a lot of people who are like, how did you like not see like that uh she's i don't know that it's kind of disturbing to follow or there's a lot of red flags so i started following teal back in uh 2012 2013 i found her youtube channel she was going by teal scott back then and uh i was really inspired by her videos i found them they really i was really drawn into them i found them very like comforting maybe it was like the the music and the way that she was talking and I was into kind of like new agey stuff. And while a lot of it seemed really strange and unusual to say the least, I was like, well, I'm going to take on a new perspective and maybe this will help me in life. She ended up uh, um, hosting a workshop in uh, close to me. And I was like, I'm going to go. I've never done anything like this, but I want to meet other people. Um, I was really starved for a sense of community and kind of being around other people who are into the same sort of thing as I am. And I'm like, I'm going to go to this workshop. I've never done something like this before, but I'm going to go. And so I did. And lo and behold, the very first workshop I went to, she calls me up on stage. So I got called up on stage. Yep. In front of the whole crowd of people. But uh, I think I was uh, vulnerable on stage. I ended up crying on stage because I like so badly wanted to like have just be accepted by people. And I think that's what made me um, susceptible to uh, that whole situation is I wanted to feel like I'm part of a community, a part of something new and exciting. Uh, it was uh, um, 2014, the summer of 2014. Okay. So that's the first time I met her and okay. uh, her community. Um, I ended up becoming uh, friends and pretty close with somebody in her inner circle at the time. Ooh. I ended up attending two more workshops one that I volunteered in. So I got to have like a bit of a backstage view as a volunteer. The best part of that experience uh, is just meeting the people. And I've met some really, really nice people and really good hearted, uh, creative, beautiful people. And I'm grateful for that. I'm still uh, acquaintances, at least with some of them. I like to focus on having compassion for the people that follow her because I have an understanding because I was one of them. When I hear people criticizing like followers of hers, I'm like, I know that most of them I think are there for with like good for good reason, with good intention. Like they they are inspired by her. She does give them permission in a way, gives them sort of like this way to try to seek healing within themselves or to um, in some ways it is empowering. Um, And I think that's what drew me to her too. Uh, but in the long run, it's really not the best solution. Not, not at all. Like, uh, once you start to get to really know her teachings or really know, like, kind of what she, what, what she does, it's it's very, very uh, misleading. I was curious as far as Teal is concerned. Uh, you mentioned part of the allure was you were into new agey religions and those sort of sciences. Are you still someone who's into that or 
did your removal of Teal sort of remove you from those ideas too? Ugh, uh, <laughs> no, I, I'm not into that. Um, no, no. Uh, if anything, uh, my ex whole experience with Teal has led me into the world of skepticism and mm -hmm. um, which is actually kind of how I ended up on like watching your channel eventually through Rachel Oates, I think maybe. I, I'm also interested, uh, like RK was saying about the new age stuff. What do you think it is or what is it that drew you into new age beliefs in the first place? And why do you think people are uh, interested in them? I think it's wishful thinking in some ways, magical thinking. Um, it's sort of a, uh, as somebody who has a prior religious background when I was younger and then um, deconstructing that it's, you, know, you hear a lot of stories of people who um, may have grew up, grown up a religious, then kind of a lot of times will find something that they're drawn to that is a bit cultish. And mm -hmm. I think that's what happened to me. Maybe I was more susceptible without realizing it. Um, and that's a generalized statement. Maybe I shouldn't say that. But um, in my case, I'll only speak for myself, not for other people. But in my, my case, I have... Um, uh, a history of being very religious when I was younger. And then in my early 20s, I went through a long, difficult process of, of uh, deconstructing that and uh, no longer being religious and realizing kind of the, the harm that that did in my life. And, but I still, I think on some level wanted a connection and feeling of like being spiritual, but not religious. And I think that's what mm -hmm. led me to new agey stuff. I met other people who were into crystals. I was like, well, it's a completely different perspective than what I had before. And so I was, it was the curiosity, like, what mm -hmm. if this is true? I'm interested in hearing about your experience going up on stage. What was that? What, what, what did you talk to her about? What were the questions you asked her? What kind of advice did she give you? I'm just curious that because the stuff in the documentary was pretty extreme. I'll, we'll talk about the documentary later, but I'm curious what happened when, uh, when you went on stage. I think that this was before she was, um teaching the completion process mm -hmm. so i don't remember exactly and it's been so long 2014 i don't remember exactly what i talked about i remember going up and talking about how do i feel something about like self love or feeling accepted and wanting community and um feeling more confident something along those lines um, it's something that I had struggled with for a long time and still kind of grapple with, you know, people in the audience going like, you're part of our community now, you belong mm -hmm. with us. And I was like, you know, love bombed afterwards and lots of hugs and feeling like, you know, that kind of euphoric acceptance with it from everybody. And, um, so that's what it was. I don't remember exactly. Uh, yeah, I don't remember what Teal said with me. I remember oh. crying. I remember crying on stage. That's great. I don't know how dark you want me to get in there. As dark as you want is fine. Like, my whole video is just going to have a big warning at the beginning because okay, everything related okay. to Teal is dark. You can't, <laughs> you can't take it lightheartedly at all. It's not like, it's not like Rachel Hollis. Or no, something. It's, it's not at all. Really a lot darker than, than that. I think I'm mm -hmm. so trigger warning. I uh, want to talk about um, abuse. So mm. Growing up, I was a, a, a victim of, of child abuse, of um, CSA, and that was the Teal story that she that she would um, say about her um, experience was so much worse than mine, but if she could find a way out of it, then maybe I could learn something from that too, and that was a big reason why I was drawn to her too. The fact that she was so open about being abused and, and like touting that she has the way out is what drew me to her too. It wasn't so much just like new agey fun frou-frou stuff. Like I wanted, I was seeking for uh, deep healing. Um, and I also didn't have health insurance at the time. So I couldn't go to a licensed therapist. So it was kind of like, I got to figure out how to heal myself. And that's what also drew me to her. And my understanding is that she targets people like me or uh, situations where they're they're seeking comfort they're seeking answers they're seeking ways to to heal themselves and um that um i know that there are um there's the possibility allegedly of of her maybe implanting false memories in people i never did anything like that with her um 
myself. Uh, I saw it happen on stage um, at a workshop where I suspect that might have been happening, allegedly. So she didn't do that with me. I was, um, I, like I said, I had, um, uh, growing up, uh, I was a victim. And so her story being a lot worse than mine, I figured, well, if she can go through a lot worse abuse than I did and she can get out of it, then like she has some sort of answer for me. So uh, that I think is probably one of the most insidious things. Yeah. That that she uses potentially uses that story in order to to bring people to her when she doesn't have um, when these people myself I should have gone to a, um, a therapist I should have gone mm. to somebody who's who's clinically trained and who has um, credentials which yeah. I did years later, which I did afterwards, thankfully. And in her workshops, she calls them synchronization workshops. And that we're all, the, like the way that she, the kind of storytelling here is that we're all drawn because we're all sort of sharing in a similar energ energetic vibration. We're all in a, we all have similar issues. So when she calls people up on stage, she's not just calling that person. She explains that she's, um, she's tapping into the energy of the room. And this is a message that everybody there or most people there should, should hear. So I like once again, it's sort of like painting everybody with like the one brush. It sounds kind of beautiful that you were able to make these friends and share such a wonderful connection with them and get to know them on such a deep level. When you finally left, did you keep in contact with any of them? I kind of left quietly. So um, I didn't, I didn't really, didn't really announce it. And I'm still a little kind of like, oh, I just don't want to get into it with the people that are still um, you know, still don't, don't see things the same way that I do. Um, I think we found a, a small community of people who are like former healers and we kind of like process things and share things with one another and point things out. And I did that for a little bit when, uh, when I first was getting out of it, um, that helped me to, that helped me to, yeah, kind of hear other people's perspective and, um, work out my thoughts and and also sort of like my anger around it like how could I be duped but I wasn't really public about leaving because I was still uh, friends with um, somebody in our, in, our, in our circle I think I might have told them I think we both sort of just didn't touch on the subject we sort of like agreed to disagree or, or kind of respected each other's boundaries and we sort of just over the last five years like slipped away and I'm not really close with that many people now. I have a few people still that I'm friends with, but we just don't, I don't really talk about it much. So this is my first sort of public coming out of like, I'm a former Teeler. I would have like an emotional response when people would criticize Teal, like, why do you like her? Like she's she's running a cult. And I don't know, like I even, uh, even now I don't necessarily like using that word. I think that what's more important is not, to me, especially for not her immediate inner circle, but just the, followers in general, people who are inspired by her in general, I think what's more important is to ask yourself whether what she is uh, doing is empowering you or disempowering you or, or people in general, and to really look at her true behavior. Like she has a tendency to like say one thing, but behave in a completely different way. The way, for example, the way she discredits science and, and the way she discredits uh, qualified uh, mental health professionals like, like she has the answer, but they don't. One of the things I used to say was like, I don't put her up on a pedestal. I take what I, you know, I don't agree with everything that she says. Like she was an anti-vaxxer at the time. Like she, she had videos about like vaccines are like going to be seen in the future as like a very harmful thing that we did to society. And I was like, that's just very not true. And I'm very yeah. against that. Yeah. And there, there were people that I, I was around in the, in the, in the uh, like Teal tribe community that like just listened to everything that she said and her word was the right way because she knows better. And I remember like pushing back against that one. Like she doesn't have all the answers. Like she's, you know, she's anti-vax. Like that's not right. Like yeah. there, that's, that's, um, and so I would point a few things out, but I'm like, I would always say like, I don't, agree with everything that she says and I don't put her up on a pedestal I just love this community and I and I'm inspired by her and um and I hear people saying that now and I'm like there's there's so much more to it than than you think like you, you think you're not putting her up on a pedestal you think you're not like following her but 
like really ask yourself like if, if you she were to be taken out of the picture completely how would you feel i think that's interesting because a lot of i've been looking at some of her videos to see how she's kind of defended herself against a lot of the claims that she's gotten and that has been a common thing that she says where she's like people don't have to agree with me i encourage people to question me i encourage people to agree to disagree with me on certain topics that's kind of she keeps saying that but then i hear from a lot of people that that wasn't entirely true so i guess you know you disagreed with her on the vaccine thing i'm wondering what what was that like were did were you discouraged from disagreeing with her or was there still a level of influence that she had even when you did disagree how did that work for me or from other people uh, from your perspective right. and from what you saw it both ways yeah um, I mean, I think that there was some pushback from the people that I'd spoken to in, mm -hmm. in the room at that moment. Uh, they're kind of like, well, no, like she, you know, she knows better. She has like access to the Akashic records or whatever BS. I don't remember exactly what was, what was said. And I'm like, mm, no, you know, <laughs> so I, it didn't sway me. And if anything, yeah. I was just like, I don't want to blindly follow somebody. I thought at the time that I wasn't like following her. But I think that once I started opening my eyes up to the reality of like who she really is and kind of the, the harm in a lot of her um, teachings, it was really shocking. And it was really uh, difficult to admit to myself like, oh my gosh, I've been like so kind of like doughy eyed um, with Teal Tribe and, and like going to the workshops and I was found it so healing, but <laughs> like, a lot of it was just, it was just like an illusion. And uh, it was really difficult to, to admit that you're wrong. You know, people kind of dig their heels in because they don't want to admit that they're wrong. And I get that. Like, it's it's a painful thing to sort, sort of admit. I'm curious what, like you mentioned, you know, noticing that some of these things weren't true and figuring out who she really was. I'm mm -hmm. curious what it was that finally inspired you to leave and what the process was like of you starting to, you know, disagree with things or disagree with the teachings and what eventually led you to leaving altogether? I think a lot of the red flags started adding up. So for example, um, I was um, sitting outside on a picnic with her with a group of people with the volunteers in the workshop. And she had told one of the attendees, like, you know, at night you astral project. And um, I sometimes, uh, go and follow you and I see where you go and you have like CIA agents that that will like uh travel after you and and you're just too fast for them so they can't keep up and that's why they have like an interest in you because you can you can travel through the astral realm and and just like zip past uh, you know zip past them through different dimensions and escape them and so they 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 try to target you but they can't like you're really really skilled at astral projection and I was just like and I could see that person like lighting up and like, oh, I'm special. Mm. Like I have something special about me. I have this special magical power and, and, and Teal's recognizing that in me. And I saw like things like that. Um, I think a lot of her videos, while a lot of them are you know, definitely questionable, her demeanor in the videos is very calm and soothing. And she, she uses a lot of, um, she refers to a lot of things that may be true or maybe, you know, maybe interesting. There's, there has to be some element of truth to what she says. Otherwise people wouldn't be drawn to it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I started noticing that I started questioning that her, a lot of the, her communication with people was like getting them to do things for her. So the people in her immediate circle and even the friend that I, ha that I have, um, they would do all of her chores, you know, um, do like everything had to be doting upon Teal, um, planning her wedding for free, like doing the entire process. Like, I'm like, you're being taken advantage of and mm -hmm. not getting paid for it. You're being taken advantage of. And I think like she has no qualms about taking advantage of the people around her. Even in uh, the Teal Tribe Facebook group, there was a person who, I don't know what happened between them. I think maybe she questioned something of, um, uh, directed something at Teal. And Teal basically had like everybody go into a chat where she Teal started debating this person and then everybody just started attacking this person. And oh, Teal wow. didn't stop it. Teal didn't stop it. I'm like, as, a, as like this spiritual leader who's supposed to be somebody who's healing it's like she sort of egged them on 
Mm-hmm. And that was another red flag. And I'm like, how could you do this to this person? A bunch of little things that sort of added up. She had told me in person that like, I want to be, she, she could tell in me that I have this big maternal instinct and that I want to be a mother. And that like, cannot be further from the truth. I'm like, no, that's BS. You're just looking at my mm-hmm. figure or something and thinking that like making assumptions about me that aren't true. So I was like, she's not all, <laughs> all knowing and all powerful. Like, like at the time she was more um, about like radical openness and authenticity I think was the word she used a lot she was all about authenticity like you're not being authentic and I remember like her ex-husband back when they were still together in a video once was like well yeah being like radically authentic you can't be authentic you have to have some boundaries and she's like no you don't and he's like well then just give your bank information right now like give it out mm-hmm. and she's like I should I should do that <laughs> she didn't did she I'm just saying, no she didn't I think the other thing that really bothered me about um her one other thing I wanted to mention is like when it comes to the crowd of people that were drawn to hers there were a lot of people um uh that were attracted to her and like were going to the workshop not because they're looking for like self-improvement but because they wanted to, to like sleep with her and stuff or, or they oh, wanted wow. to get in the pants of other women that were there i had a at one of the houses i stayed at there was a guy who was like talking to all the girls and he was like, really trying to impress some i don't know he was he was creepy and i was just like sitting outside with him just like making small talk and he's like okay i'm gonna be honest with you i don't want to talk to you and i was like oh why and he's like well because i don't i don't want to like i don't want to fuck you and i'm like no, it's the only reason to talk to someone, obviously. <laughs> That's the kind of people that sometimes get go to these kinds of things. And I was just like, where did that come from? And I, uh, thank you, I don't either. Like, the, one of the things that she did is uh, anytime that somebody, like, makes a video about her, it's always because they're opportunists. They want to make yeah, money off of it. That's me, I'm like, an opportunist. If, that's us. Yeah. We did a week on her because we're opportunists. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to make so much money off of this. The only thing I want to gain from this is, uh, like, I have nothing to promote. I don't care. I did not care to speak up about her or share my story and my perspective at all, except that I see, like, I see the comments that people make on uh, her video, or not her videos, but videos about her. I don't watch her videos anymore, but videos about her or TikTok or or wherever, Facebook, I don't know. And and there's like people who are well-meaning or don't really know um, that her stuff can be really disempowering. And I feel like the more people who speak up, the better because the people need to feel safe to speak up about her. Throughout most followers' recollections of their time following Teal, One word, one particular concept always seems to pop up. Cult. Many who used to follow Teal but have left her teachings behind now regard their time with her as an experience like being part of a cult, with Teal as their leader. Teal herself, of course, denies these allegations. So who's right? Well, before we can determine that, first, we must dive into what makes something a cult. Part three. What is a cult? Often on this channel, when we've analyzed whether anything from a multi-level marketing company to a political party can be a cult, we've used the Byte model, coined by Stephen Hassan, former member of the Mooney's cult in the 1970s. Byte, in this context, stands for behavior control, information control, thought control, and emotional control. If your organization has those qualities, it's likely that it could be somewhere on the cult spectrum. Additionally, in her 2021 book, Cultish, Amanda Montel discusses the different types of cults that exist. For example, both Scientology and CrossFit have specialized language that they use to signify belonging within the group. Both of these groups could be said to have cult-like characteristics, although the stakes in these two situations are wildly different. So whether something is or is not a cult exists on a spectrum. It's not so easy as saying this is 100% a cult and this is 100% not a cult. Montel also points out that telling someone who's currently in a cult that they're in a cult can function as somewhat of a thought stopper. Just as cults use thought stopping language to keep their members from questioning their leader's teachings, those outside of cults may use the same tactics. That is to say, accusing someone of being in a cult is rarely effective. So is Teal Swan running a cult? Let's look at some viewpoints on this. First, since we just talked about Amanda Montel, let's see what her book Cultish has to say about Teal Swan herself. When it comes to suicide cult leaders, I can think of just one woman who's gained any significant amount of attention and authority. Her name is Teal Swan, and at the time of this writing, she is very much still alive. 
Swan is a 30-something self-help guru who operates mostly on social media. To her loyalists, she's known as the spiritual catalyst. To her critics, she's the suicide catalyst. On the cultish continuum, Swan seems to fall about halfway between Gwyneth Paltrow and Marshall Applewhite. The midpoint between a self-serving wellness influencer and a bona fide sociopath. Most people who find Swan do so on YouTube. There, her personal transformation videos offer tutorials on everything from how to overcome addiction to how to open your third eye. She started posting videos in 2007, and altogether, they have received tens of millions of views. Swan utilizes SEO strategies to target the lonely internet searches of people struggling with depression and suicidal thoughts. A person might search, I'm all alone, or why does this hurt so much? And those key words could lead them to her content. Not everyone who follows Swan becomes a follower follower, but those who do might receive an invitation to the Teal Tribe, her exclusive Facebook group dedicated to her most committed adherents. Eventually, they might attend one of her in-person workshops or fly down to her pricey retreat center in Costa Rica to undergo the completion process, her signature trauma healing technique. Swan has no mental health accreditation. She uses an assortment of dubious psychological treatments like recovered memory therapy, the controversial practice of unearthing repressed memories, which was popular during the satanic panic and which Swan claims to have undergone as a child to uncover lost flashbacks of satanic ritual abuse. Most modern psychologists say this exercise actually implants false memories and can be deeply traumatic for patients. But Swan's unique vocabulary of tealisms helps her establish herself as a trustworthy spiritual and scientific authority. Like Jim Jones, who could use the Bible to preach socialism, Swan invokes Eastern metaphysics to diagnose mental health disorders. She blurs mystical talk of synchronicity, frequency, and the Akashic records with the formal language of the DSM, borderline, PTSD, clinical depression. For people struggling with their mental health who haven't found a solution through traditional therapy and pharmaceuticals, her brand of occultic psychobabble creates the impression that she has tapped into a power higher than science. This marriage of medical jargon with supernatural speak is nothing new either. It's a strategy problematic gurus from Scientology's L. Ron Hubbard to Nexium's Keith Raniere have employed for decades. In the social media age, a throng of shady online oracles have followed in Swan's footsteps, using the speech dial to capitalize on Western culture's resurrected interest in the new age. We'll meet some of her controversial contemporaries in part six. Swan hasn't caused any mass suicides, but at least two of her mentees have taken their own lives. Critics attribute these tragedies to the fact that Swan uses a range of highly triggering terms to talk about suicide. I can see your vibrations and you're passively suicidal. And the hospitals and suicide helpline do nothing are a sampling of her signature thought-terminating cliches. Although she claims not to support or encourage suicide, Swan touts these sayings in combination with emotionally loaded metaphors like, death is a gift you give yourself, and suicide is pushing the reset button. As Swan posted on her blog, suicide happens because we all intuitively, if not mentally, know what is waiting for us after death is the pure positive vibration of source energy. The YouTuber Telltale also made a few videos discussing whether Teal Swan is running a cult. After his first video about the topic came out, Teal made a video responding to cult allegations, although Telltale himself doesn't believe that these two events are related. In either case, he made a video responding to Teal's rebuttals about being in a cult. I am a personal transformation revolutionary. I am not a cult leader. Yanya Lalich and Michael D. Lanagon, in association with the ICSA, created a cult checklist a way to tell if a group is in fact a cult or not. Questioning, doubt, and dissent are discouraged or even punished. I encourage questioning. On top of this, I find doubt actually to be quite healthy. The bite model equivalent to this one would be rejection of rational analysis, critical thinking, and doubt. So she finds doubt to be healthy, but doubt directed toward what? Directed toward her own belief system? If somebody comes out and starts questioning her quote unquote teaching materials or her ideas, is she gonna call it equally as healthy? That's basically what I'm doing here. Is she in favor of this video? Or is she gonna call me an apostate, a disbeliever, a dissenter? Or the words she uses to describe people who doubt and question her materials, a hater. Mind altering practices are used in excess and serve to suppress doubts about the group and its leaders. No consciousness altering states are encouraged by me or used by people who follow my material for the purpose of suppressing because suppression is something that I actively teach against. Oh, so they do use mind altering practices. It's just not intended to be used for the purpose of suppressing. I don't really care what the intended use is. What's the end result? The leadership dictates, sometimes in great detail, how members should think, act, and feel. For example, members must get permission to date, permission to change jobs, permission to marry, like every other person. I have ideas and opinions about what the healthiest thing for people to do and to think is. Like every other spiritual leader, my opinion is in fact the cornerstone of my entire career. I don't tell people who to date, who to marry. They don't need my permission for any of this. I don't tell them what job they can have or not have. Those were just examples. That isn't the entire point. The point is that you dictate how people should act, think, and feel. As she said, that's the cornerstone of her career. That's what she's all about. That's what the group is all about. Unity on thoughts, feelings, and actions. That's the cornerstone of a cult. And perhaps one of the greatest accusers of Teal running a cult is the Freeform and Hulu documentary, The Deep End itself. Let's take a look at what this documentary has to say 
how Teal responded, and what my overall review is. In this section, I'm going to summarize and give an overview of the documentary, The Deep End. I'll give a few of my own opinions. However, most of this section is just going to be an overview of what happened in the show on screen in the documentary itself. Parts five and six of this video will go into how Teal herself responded to the show, as well as my overall thoughts, opinions, and review of it. The Deep End is a four-part series produced by Freeform, available to stream on Hulu. The producers of the series spent three years following Teal Swan and her employees, or her inner circle, as she calls it over the course of retreats, conferences, and more. At the time that I'm filming this video, only three episodes have been released so far, so I'll base my review on the contents and context of those three episodes. However, if episode four comes out before I post this video, I'll edit in a review of that as well. Hello guys, Editing Savvy here, and the fourth episode of the docuseries The Deep End just came out, so I just watched it. Documentary presents strong evidence that Teal is a cult leader. However, Teal herself counters this evidence by showing how bits of the documentary were selectively edited and taken out of context to make her look as bad as possible. So, what actually happened? Got my notes here in my little Savvy Writes Books notebook. Took a bunch of notes on this documentary. I watched it through twice. Let's do it. The first episode of the documentary is called The Lost Toys. This episode opens with a shot of Teal dunking someone underwater, which is somewhat foreshadowing of the water motif throughout the documentary, as well as what's yet to come with some of the water practices that Teal does. Then they show a conference, which is set up much like a Tony Robbins style conference. We get a mention of the process of ending one's life very early on within the first 10 minutes of the documentary. Teal says, you know, I'm not like a regular celebrity. People are are listening to me at 3 a.m. when they want to end their lives. On stage, a participant tries to tell Teal, you know, I'm not really sure what my purpose is in this world. I'm nothing makes me happy. I have no goals. And Teal kind of says, why are you still here? And the person's like, well, I don't really know why I'm up here on stage. And Teal says, no, why are you still here on this planet? Trying to get her to question whether she's committed to living or not. Teal then talks about how she uses these techniques to get people to play out both sides of a potential scenario and try to help people get over their unnatural fear of death. She then refers to her audience and her main viewers as a set of lost toys, somewhat indicating that she does target vulnerable populations, but from her perspective, probably indicating that she wants to create a community for people that feel like they don't have one. Then we see a few shots of some of her followers at the completion process retreat. One of them has the quote, I feel like she's Jesus. One of the first lines we get when we see what's going on inside the retreat is Teal saying something about how, you know, pharmaceutical companies are just using a quick fix. We're in the business of healing. We're not in the business of a quick fix. The pharmaceutical companies want to capitalize on that. And I think that this deserves somewhat of a nuanced take because yes, pharmaceuticals and medications are not the answer for everything. And there are many issues with corporate companies that run, that produce medications, having a patent for a product, not allowing people to produce generics, price gouging medications and things like that. It can be a very difficult system, but that doesn't mean that medications themselves are bad. I am on SSRIs for my OCD. It has made my life a million times better. I know other people for whom medication for mental health issues has absolutely saved their life. So to put down all medication as bad is something that I don't condone whatsoever and I think is incredibly dangerous. But at the same time, I do think that there needs to be a discussion about the fact that a lot of mental health treatments aren't accessible to everybody, that a lot of times we have issues with healthcare where people don't have health insurance and aren't able to access mental health treatments. There's a much larger conversation that needs to go on here, which I'm going to continue to go into a little more in this. But I do want to say that I wasn't a big fan of Teal putting down the mental health uh, medications industry. Then she talks about about uh, resurfacing memories. She talks a lot in this about how a lot of memories stem from childhood trauma and a lot of trauma comes from our early childhood. And this was the first place where I kind of got the vibe that Teal seems to think that, you know, if something worked for her or something was true in her experience, that it's going to be universally true across the board because her trauma happened mostly during childhood and that set the tone for a lot of things. And she was able to uncover certain memories she seems to think that that's going to be true for everybody when in fact therapy is a very individualized process. So that's part of the danger as well. She talks about the way that people come to her because they need connection. And I think that this is absolutely true. In fact, when I was reading Amanda Montel's book, Cultish, that's one of the points that Montel brings up in this book is that 
cults often form from our need for connection. And this is not to say only dangerous cults. Again, as we said, cults exist on a spectrum. You could say that something like CrossFit has cult-like behaviors and that's people will join a gym with a strong sense of community because we need community. We need more human connection in this world. Now that can go to the extreme as she talks about cults like Heaven's Gate and Jonestown and things like that as well, where in those cases, those caused mass deaths. But there are also groups with cult adjacent type things things that spring up as a result of people's desire for more unity and more connection to those around them. Then we see a guest at the retreat named Simon speak up and Teal does respond to this point so we'll talk about this as well. But in the documentary, the way it's shown, there's a guest named Simon and he basically says, is there anyone you have enough respect for that they could challenge you? The documentary then shows Teal getting very offended by this and saying, I don't look up to anyone. She compares herself to the Dalai Lama, uh, which is a little bit hypocritical because the Dalai Lama is all about being humble, which it just seemed very weird. Then she talked about how she doesn't need to look up to anyone because if you line up all the people who are the fastest people in the world uh, on earth and had them race, you wouldn't say to the, the one who wins the race, well, you can't teach me running because there's no one faster than you. So basically she's saying she's at the forefront. She's the fastest one in the race. And then she basically questions, do you believe that's me? Do you believe that I am the person to do this? Then the documentary delves into Teal's backstory, which we talked about earlier with all of her childhood trauma. Next, we meet a woman named Juliana. So Juliana is Blake's girlfriend. As I mentioned earlier, Blake is the ex-boyfriend of Teal, but they've had kind of a platonic partnership going on where the two of them have run Teal's business together and lived together for about 16 years. And during that time, Teal had five marriages to other people. Blake had relationships with other people. And now Blake is starting a relationship with this woman, Juliana, who lives in Germany. She went to one of Teal's retreats. She met Blake there. They kind of hit it off. And now she's uh, heading from Germany and moving to Utah to live with the Teal tribe, as it's called. We then see some of the inner conflicts in this group with Teal being scared of Juliana living with them because as Teal says, you know, anyone who has access to me has an instant platform. Teal becomes worried about her own reputation in this case. Um, and it really gives off the vibe that she doesn't really want Blake making his own choices without her approval, that Teal needs to approve Juliana first and Teal needs to be able to say, mm, is Juliana going to be a safe person for this group? Is she going to be safe for this business? If I let anyone get close to me, could they, you know, hurt my reputation in some way? So thinking a little bit more about her brand than about her supposed best friend's relationship. Then we go back to a conference with another follower who's considering ending their life and basically this person's asking Teal, how do I know if my time is done or not? And Teal says, if you're asking that question, it's not done, which I mean, I think is a true. So, but again, I don't think Teal's qualified to be dealing with people who are in the process of considering ending their life in the first place. We have some audio in the background from a vlogger asking who regulates this stuff. And that's where we learn, you know, how Teal kind of has no psychological qualifications whatsoever. And you know, the self-help industry isn't regulated and whether it should be is up for debate. Then it talks about how Teal has likened, you know, the process of ending your life to a reset button. There's a mother that appears on the video and I believe that's the mother of Leslie that we talked about earlier. And she says that she does believe Teal's teachings encouraged her daughter to take her own life and she somewhat blames Teal for that. And then at the end of the episode, Teal ends the episode by saying that she'd like to become more spiritually influential than the Pope. Episode two is called The Safe Place. Uh, it opens up with Teal discussing her vision for her company as a whole, which I don't know if it's the way that the documentary is edited or the way that she describes it herself, but it comes across as once again, kind of a vague business guru, self-help guru mission about making the world better and healing people and all of this stuff without a super clear, concrete goal of what they're selling or what they're really producing as a company. Then we learn more about Teal's inner circle who are volunteers who learn from her in exchange for working from her. Doesn't seem like people really get paid, but they do get room and board. I'm not entirely sure how the process works. We meet a guy named Cyan, who is a member of Teal's inner circle, and he changed his name. His name used to be Matthew, and then mentions that he and Teal came up with the name Cyan together. 
So that set off a few alarm bells. First of all, the fact that this guy is naming himself after a, a different shade of blue. She's teal and he's cyan. Okay. And then on top of that, it kind of reminded me of when I did that video interviewing Rachel Hollis's former employee and we had Rachel talking about, you know, this person on my team, her name was also Rachel, but there could be only one of us. So I changed her name to RC, that whole thing. Whenever you have an employer or a person who has authority over you in an organization, changing your name with you it always seems a little weird I mean he does seem happy to be named Cyan so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tell him how to live his life it just seems weird that it's, they came up with that name together okay a little bit of a cult flag for me then we have a quote from Teal who says, everyone agreed to sacrifice their life for this mission. Then we see this setup of this potential conflict between Teal and Juliana because Juliana is coming out there not just to be in a relationship with Blake, but to be a part of this inner circle as a whole. And uh, Teal says, the problem is when a girl in his life opposes me in any way. Again, basically doing that whole, you need to be on board with my mission. I am the one who calls the shots. Then we get to meet Molly, who is a private investigator. Molly was actually hired by Teal and Matthias, who is her manager. They hired this person, Molly, because there are all these uh, allegations out there about Teal's group being a cult. And so they hired this private investigator, Molly, to look into it, to interview tons of people, to try to find the truth and all of that. I thought that Molly's sections in this were the most interesting of all. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about those. Molly mentions towards the beginning that people throw around the word cult very often as a way to just kind of shut down the conversation about something they don't like, which is definitely true. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, Amanda Montel does point that out in the book Cultish, that that can be a thought stopping technique, much like what cults use, that people outside of cults aren't immune to it. And I mean, I guess to an extent we could say we're all probably involved in some kind of cult of some sort. Is society a cult? Do we live in a society? I don't know. But anyway, she's talking about how she doesn't want to throw around the word cult too liberally. She doesn't want to just be like, this is a cult. She really needs to dig deeper and figure out if it's a cult or not first. Molly watches one of Teal's videos and in that video Teal has her viewers visualize what the process of ending their own life might be like. Teal basically says that she's doing this from a survivor's perspective and again this was another instance where it felt like Teal was taking techniques that worked for her personally and leading other people through them without any qualifications to do so, which could be dangerous if another person's specific set of mental health circumstances or specific life situation made it so that those techniques would actually do more harm than good to them. We then see Molly talking to this man named Jonathan and Jonathan is a mental health professional and he talks about how Teal's advice is actually dangerous and can do more harm than good. The next section was weird. There was a guy named Amir and he had come to the retreat last year and thought it was a cult but came back to it again because he thought Teal was hot. And he told Teal that to her face, basically. He's like, I came back because you were hot. I kind of wanted to bang you. And Teal uh, got very offended by that. But then he said that he wanted Teal's help actually emotionally because he needed to channel the spirit of his mother. That during his life, his mother had ended her own life and that had been a great source of trauma for him. And he needed to talk to his mother and Teal then says that, you know, when someone channels someone else's spirit during her retreats, that that is really their spirit. That is really who they are. They are really, that is really their spirit talking. She has Juliana channel the spirit. And this is like one of the first big channelings, at least that it's shown that Juliana does. And this is kind of what gains Teal's trust in Juliana, at least how it's shown here, is that Juliana successfully channels the spirit of Amir's dead mother. What I don't get is if it's really the spirit of the mother, why does she still have Juliana's German accent? Because accents aren't like a genetic part of your voice. I get why they'd have her voice because it's using her body, but accents are learned. So wouldn't she not have the accent? Then it had one scene that I actually really liked in this episode where it showed the inner circle playing cards against humanity and all just like playing together in their in their house and laughing together and telling goofy jokes. And I thought that this was a really important scene to show because it showed the mundane, the normal life, the sense of humor. A lot of times when we talk about is something a cult, we're looking at the most serious aspects of it, the most dire situations. But a lot of people might think, well, no, I'm not in the cult. The day-to-day -day life is very chill. We're all having fun. And it's important to show that, yes, even within a situation that may be a cult in some way, may or may not, we're still yet to determine, you still can have those moments of having fun, that, that those moments of normalcy, of mundane life are part of it all, and it's not all just constant drama. I thought that was important to show. We then see Molly interviewing Jared, who is an ex-follower of Teal's. Now, Teal's responses, 
responses to this documentary, in her responses, she points out that Jared is an ex-boyfriend of hers that they'd actually dated, and she felt that it was kind of a conflict of interest to have him talking to the investigator and saying these things about her because it was as if they were just getting, you know, words from your exes. Like, of course your exes have bad things to say about you. And she basically said everything he said was a lie. So it's his word against hers. I wasn't there. I don't know who's right. But basically he talks about how he had left the Mormon religion and gotten a divorce and he needed a community. So that's when he uh, talks about how he found Teal's paintings, which she convinced him had the power to heal people. He bought the paintings and said that that never worked. Uh, he says that Teal never paid him a salary and then claims that when he left, Teal said to him, if I were you, I would just go end my life right now. Teal denies this and says that she never told him that and that he was just lying about her. What's true, I don't know. Then we see Blake and Juliana getting married towards the end of the episode. Episode three is called The Carousel. This episode opens with a group of people at one of Teal's retreats and they are all taking on the consciousness of parents and children. I think they're trying to channel the spirits of each other. It's not clear if this is meant to be a therapy role play or a spirit channeling. When Juliana was channeling a spirit in the previous episode, Teal explicitly says, this is really a spirit being channeled. This is really your mother. But in this case, it's not clear if this is supposed to be therapy role play or if it's supposed to be a spirit being channeled. But either way, in the process, one of the people who was taking on a parent role says that they saw that there was abuse going on in the other participant's childhood, that they noticed that there was SA going on between parents and children in the family, and then this other person treated that as if that was a repressed memory that had just been unlocked. The ethics of that are squishy, to say the least. We, we then see a little more of Juliana and Blake's relationship. She feels like she's belonging in this community, but she's also missing her mom in Germany and wishes that she could see her. We see Blake doing an interview with Molly, the private investigator, um, where she asks Blake, you know, does anyone have a relationship outside of the inner circle? And he basically says that it's not discouraged, but that nobody has one. I find it hard to believe that it wasn't discouraged based on the fact that it did show that Juliana had to fit in with the inner circle for Teal to accept her relationship with Blake. However, maybe again, that could have just been the way that the narrative was constructed. I don't know. We we then meet uh, Grassi, who is Teal's personal assistant. She opens up about abuse and SA she had experienced when she was a child and mentions that some of these memories she uncovered while with Teal. Teal then does a type of ritual where she gives her frog poison and has her throw up in a bucket. I will admit I'm not a spiritual person and I have no idea what that was supposed to be. Molly then interviews Jared again and Jared says that uh, Teal's inner circle is a cult, but the outer circle is a self-help scam. Jared also says that Teal used to claim that she could read his thoughts and would falsely induce repressed memories of SA and abuse from family members that he later realized he never actually experienced and that those were constructed memories. Then we see more of Teal and Juliana where Juliana's considering going to visit her family in Germany and Teal tells her that there's no leisure travel at all involved, probably as a way to show, okay, cutting people off from friends and family. We see another Teal on stage at a self-help seminar and at this seminar we meet Sabrina who is one of Teal's fans. Sabrina, we get some interviews with her where she talks about how Therapy didn't work for her in the past. She found Teal's retreat. Teal told her that her parents didn't love her. Sabrina was like, mm, I never thought I experienced that. I always thought my parents did love me. And then she kind of said, well, Teal's psychic. So she said my parents don't love me. So I assume she has to be right about that. Sabrina's now at a new one of Teal's retreats where she tells Teal, okay, my life has gotten worse since I've started following you. I don't know what to do. This isn't working. And Teal then tells her, no, your life's actually gotten better because when you felt like your life was better before, that was you living an authentic life. And now you are being more honest with yourself and you're living an authentic life. So even though it feels worse right now, it's better. And Sabrina says, that's bullshit. Then after that, it shows Sabrina locking herself in a room and talking about how she kind of feels like ending her life right now. We then see how Teal reacts to that. And Teal seems mostly worried about her win. But again, I don't know if they shot additional footage where Teal was mostly worried about Sabrina's well-being. But from what we saw, Teal was mostly worried about her reputation and how it was going to look to have a guest in this mindset on her retreat. 
Sabrina mentions feeling like she's on a carousel, and that is the title of the episode, The Carousel. She talks about being on a carousel where she never feels better. She talks about how she feels like she has to keep coming back to these retreats, and then she goes back from them, and it never permanently gets better, so she has to come back to the retreat again. Kind of hinting at how the self-help industry preys on people's insecurities, and to an extent, kind of like the diet industry, it wants to keep people in a perpetual state of needing to come back because that's how it makes money. Teal then addresses the question of why does she have haters, and she kind of says she thinks it's because she's a woman. She's basically like, I'm a woman and people don't like women with opinions. I will say that I think it's fair to point out the misogyny in these fields like it is fair to point it out in every field. Like I've said before, I think people have been letting Tony Robbins get away with far too much for far too long. And when I've talked about how I don't like Tony Robbins, he still has hardcore fans who will tell me that he is amazing. So yes, we can talk about Teal Swan and the bad things that she's done and the harm that she's caused, but it's also important to call out the male creators and the male self-help influencers who are doing that as well. I definitely do think to an extent women tend to get more of the criticism in that arena. So I think calling out the sexism is fair, but I think for Teal to pin it all on sexism is incorrect. I think that the reason she has haters, I think that if she were a man and she were doing this, she'd have haters in the exact same way because it's not the fact that she's a woman, it's the fact that she's practicing therapy and psychology unlicensed without any credentials, without any certifications, and has led a lot of her ex-followers to be very disgruntled and a few lives have been lost, though whether that is her fault or not, I'm not going to say because I do not have that authority. We then see more of Molly, the private investigator, Investigator, and she talks about how she now has a document called the non-negotiables, which is a list of things that people must agree to in order to join Teal's inner circle. Those include, uh, you can't put your own family before Teal, you can't have personal boundaries that conflict with Teal and her mission, the personal relationships you have are your biggest liability, and you cannot have those personal relationships if they conflict with Teal's. So then, uh, she talks to Blake about that, and Blake doesn't seem that concerned about it in the moment. Finally, we get the final scene of this episode, which is one of the most disturbing things I've ever seen in my life. It's called the water breath exercise, which is supposed to hack into your subconscious mind. It's where you hold the other person, you have them do deep breaths, and then you dunk their head underwater and you hold them underwater. And you control when they come back up. It looked like waterboarding. Now we're gonna talk about how Teal said in her response that it was not waterboarding. It really looked like waterboarding, okay? It was really scary. But those were the first three episodes to the deep end. There is one episode still yet to come out and I'm excited to see that. Hello guys, Editing Savvy here and the fourth episode of the docuseries The Deep End just came out. So I just watched it, took a bunch of notes on it and I'm gonna give you guys an overview of it now as well as my thoughts on it. Got my 90s kids mug out because it was the 90s kids book birthday yesterday. Happy book birthday to me. So the fourth episode opens up with what, in my opinion, was a little bit of manipulative editing. It has Teal on stage at one of her seminars kind of going over a meditation with people where she's talking about the different types of connection we have with other people in our lives, how some of that is good and powerful and trusting connection, and how with other people that connection can have a very negative impact on us. And while she is talking about those different impacts, they're cutting in footage of the previous three episodes to kind of catch us up on that. And we see when she talks about, you know, people we love and trust, we see things with her and Blake together. And when it talks about people that we don't trust, we see like her and Juliana facing off kind of as adversaries. And I thought that was a little manipulative because when Teal was doing this meditation, like you guys know I don't trust Teal, but when she was doing this meditation, that wasn't actually what was probably going through her head. I did think it was clever editing and I thought it was well done in a visual and auditory sense. Like it gave the emotional effect that the filmmakers were going for. I think it was like well done in an objective sense, but if we're talking about trying to look at this as a piece of journalism, it definitely pushed one narrative over another and in the later part of this video, I'm going to talk about how that narrative wasn't really my favorite just because I don't think it was what the documentary should have been about if it wanted to affect the most change. But overall, it was a well done recap. From there, we see a lot of the conflict going on with Teal and Molly, who was the private investigator woman. 
Teal is talking to Molly about how one of the reasons that she hired her, one of her goals, is that there was an article that went up on Vice talking about how Teal was leading a cult, and Teal wanted to get that taken down. So she was hoping that Molly would uncover that this was not a cult so that the article could get taken down. So we see a Skype call between Teal and Molly where Molly basically says, um, answering the two questions, one, does Teal cause people to end their life? And she said, no. Does Teal run a cult? Uh, maybe. And that's what Molly kind of said. So when Molly says, you know, but is Teal running a cult? Maybe she might be. I, I'm I'm kind of not, I'm not confident that you're not running a cult. Teal gets very upset about that. You can tell that she is uh, freaking out. So what she tells Molly is basically, okay, this is my life's work. This is the work that I am doing. I don't have work-life balance, which I, as a business owner, I understand that. I don't have a lot of work-life balance either. But she's also explaining that anyone who comes into her inner circle, any employee she has, she doesn't expect them to have work-life balance either. And I don't think that's reasonable. At the very least, it's being an absolutely unethical employer. So from there, we have a weird confrontation between Teal and Juliana where... Teal is talking about how she gets these, like, vibes from Juliana that she's an adversary to her. And Juliana, she's asked Juliana, like, tell me what your honest opinion of me is. And Juliana says, like, you know, I think you're very powerful. I think you're very, you know what you want and things like that. And then Teal's like, well, that's a sugar-coated answer. Let's all go around the room and say what we think Juliana thinks of me. Which was weird because it's like, how do they know? Is everyone psychic in this group? I, again, I'm, I can be kind of naive. I tend to take people at their word. If someone says, this is what I think of you, I'm going to hope they're telling the truth. I'm not going to tell someone else how they feel about something, but that's what Teal decided to do. So everyone goes around the room and says what they think Juliana thinks of Teal, which is all negative things, and it's very uncomfortable to watch. And then at the end, we get to Teal, who says, okay, here's what I know you're thinking about me. And she lists off, like, all these negative attributes of herself. And to me, it sounded like she was just kind of going through her own insecurities and being like, you know, I'm too controlling. You think I'm too like this. You th and I'm like, well, maybe that's just you're worried that you are, you know? I don't know what makes you think Juliana thought that. And if there was something that made her think that, then it wasn't really shown on screen, which was kind of an issue. The next part, I'm not sure if the editing was deceptive or not, because we see Juliana and Blake getting ready to leave the house that they're all at together. Blake's packing up, they're getting ready to leave, and Teal starts berating him on the way out and telling him that he's like a super weak loser and that without her, he's going to be the weakest person ever or whatever. But we never saw her in the room in that scene saying those words out of her mouth, so I'm almost wondering if she said that in a different context originally and it was edited there for maximum dramatic effect. I'm not sure because Teal's reaction to the this episode is not out yet because, you know, it just premiered on Hulu today. Uh, so I wasn't able to uh, get her perspective on that, which again would be another whole he said, she said type of thing. But I didn't really know what to make of that scene in general. So then Blake and Juliana go to their own apartment and he goes onto Facebook to make an announcement that he's stepping back from Teal's company. He is no longer going to be working for her. He's no longer a part of this. He gets all these messages of support, people saying, okay, we wish you and your new wife a very happy life together, happy going in a different direction, which sounds nice that the followers didn't, didn't weren't mad at him. But Teal says, there's a quote from her then saying, and, and I don't think this could have been taken out of context because she says this verbatim. She says, all these people wishing him and his wife a happy life together, if they knew what had happened, they'd want her dead. And I'm like, what happened though? I don't know if this was a failure on the part of the documentary to show what happened or if Teal really is just blowing out of proportion the fact that she and Juliana weren't always on the same like frequency vibration or something. I don't know. Then uh, Teal basically talks about how Blake was her family. And that does kind of make sense because if we talk, you know, when we talked earlier about the abuse that she'd gone through, he was kind of the first person that she was able to trust and that she went to after all of this. And that can be really hard when you build those strong connections connections with people and they, after a long time, a relationship of some type, whether romantic or friendship based or business partnership, whenever any type of relationship like that ends up breaking apart, it can be really devastating. So I do understand her feelings there. Uh, she talks about how he's broken her trust. I don't fully understand how he's broken her trust because from what the documentary showed, all he did was leave a job. He said, I don't really want to work for you anymore. I don't think he said anything about not wanting to have any friendship with her anymore or didn't want to be in contact with her anymore. All he said was that he was leaving the job. So I'm not sure what's going on there. It looked like what it was trying to show was that Teal stops trusting you if you stop working for her, which very well could be what's happening. I was just a little confused. Overall, this episode was kind of a mess. So then she has a meeting with the team where they talk about like, 
making an agreement of what their personal boundaries are actually allowed to be going forward. And she talks about, like, I want you guys to have romantic partners, but not if they're going to be incompatible with what I'm doing. So basically the idea is if these people are going to work for Teal and be part of her inner circle, then their romantic partners also have to be willing to be on board with the same mission. There are going to be, like, no relationships where people don't believe in what Teal's doing, which... That was a huge red flag to me. So we get Molly working on her final report, and Molly's talking about how she's kind of sad since she was hired by Teal's team, and t that Teal's team isn't happy with the result. Molly is worried that her report is just going to kind of get shelved, and she worked so hard on it, and it's not really going to go anywhere. But basically what she talks about how is it's a shame that... Uh, Teal isn't really open to criticism and doesn't really go outside her own comfort zone and she thinks that that's going to be to the detriment of everyone, especially Teal's followers who are vulnerable people. Then we see uh, Juliana getting to visit Germany with Blake, which is nice, and then Teal has another big workshop and in this workshop she's certifying people in the completion process training, which is very weird because uh, she doesn't think that you need credentials to be doing this type of work, yet she wants to certify you in her own process. So why is her certification worth anything? Is that a credential? Like, I don't know what's going on there, but she's basically certifying people to be able to do the completion process to other people, which I don't know, maybe that might turn into a pyramid scheme one day, who knows? The episode ends with Teal asking the room, does anyone feel like they're in pain and don't know how to get out of it? And everyone's hand goes up. So it kind of shows that we're moving into this happening again and Teal once again wanting to end the pain of other people and do more unlicensed therapy to people and things like that. Overall, I felt that episode four was kind of a mess in terms of storyline. I didn't always fully understand what was happening in the conflict. Like, were Blake and Teal ending their entire friendship or was he just moving away from the company? And what was happening there was not really shown on screen. And I don't know if that's because they were trying to be vague for dramatic effect or to push a certain narrative, but I thought it was to the detriment of the series as a whole and the overall enjoyment of it. And I just felt that there were a lot of things that relied on editing of juxtaposing audio with visuals in it, which can be very good for narrative filmmaking, but when you're doing a documentary, I want to see a lot more of like what I know is happening in the moment and seeing things, seeing words coming out of people's mouths as they're saying them, as opposed to seeing footage with uh, audio in the background that may or may not have been edited to push a certain idea. So overall, after watching this entire documentary, after watching all four episodes, I do still think that Teal is an incredibly dangerous person but I think that the documentary could have done a lot more to show explicitly why. And a lot of that came down to some of the visual and editing choices made. And I think that those choices may have been made in service of making it look and sound really good and making an aesthetically pleasing product that people would like to watch as a movie and things like that, which I understand since uh, everybody wants to watch these things as entertainment, as something beautiful. But I think if it were trying to go more the documentary route, there was a lot more it could have done, especially in the finale episode. But again, I'm going to talk about that more later in my review section. So let's go back to non-editing savvy. As we all know, in the industry of creating media, there are always things that aren't going to be part of the full story. We're always only going to see a piece of things, right? So I think it's important that we take a look at what Teal herself had to say about this. Part five, Teal's responses to each episode of the docuseries. A few days after the premiere of each episode, Teal releases a video on her YouTube channel giving her perspective about the docuseries. Her overall criticism can basically be summed up as, they edited it to take me out of context and make me look like a cult leader. Now, I have mixed feelings about the sentiment of taking someone out of context. On the one hand, many harmful self-help influencers like Jordan Peterson, who's going to be getting his own video in about two months, stay tuned. Uh, they've used this as kind of a get out of jail free card for saying and doing hurtful things to other people and then just claiming that everything is somehow out of context. On the other hand, Teal isn't wrong that if you do follow someone for three years, it's likely that you'll find some things that they say that don't sound great when you juxtapose them with the right things. Hell, I'm sure you could find clips of me saying things that sound awful when you edit them in the right way. So I won't write off this concern of Teal's entirely. I think we need to look a little deeper into what she actually has to say. So let's look at her response to episode one. I'm very happy about the scene where I'm explaining the difference between healing and just feeling better. In this segment, I also got to present to the world the idea that regarding mental health, 
we need to start asking what happened to you instead of what is wrong with you. I appreciate that she started off with the positive. I think that was a smart move on her part. This is a documentary series, and all documentaries start with lots of video. I mean hundreds and hundreds of hours. And that collective footage is then edited down to tell a story. Some things are included, but a lot always gets cut out. Watching this episode helped me realize something about my work. If literally anything, positive or negative, is taken out of context, and I mean a very long context, it can no longer be properly or fully understood. As I said, I think that this is a fair point to make, and if the editing truly was deceptive, I do think it's fair for her to point that out, so let's take a look at some of her examples. Speaking of editing, there was a scene where I was being challenged at one of my retreats by an attendee who was concerned that I have no one that I look up to. The reality is that this interaction was crazy long, yet the entire conversation was reduced to several carefully selected cuts that, in my opinion, make me look like I have no tolerance for being questioned, which just isn't true. I invite questioning. The way this segment was cut makes me come across like an aggressive, egotistical megalomaniac, which I'm not. And unfortunately, because these cuts were removed from their full context, you didn't get to see the part where I said what I always say. That once your awareness gets to a certain point, the need for one specific teacher is gone because you understand that you can learn from anything, everyone, and every single thing you come into contact with in the world. Thus, everything and everyone becomes your teacher. Unfortunately, my haters will love how this scene is cut. I'm glad she addressed this regarding Simon, but I still don't think her defense is quite enough here. Yes, I, I don't think that mentorship is necessarily required. However, I do think the way she responded to Simon regarding, you know, do you, don't you think that's me? Do you not believe that's me? It did feel like she was placing pressure on him in a socially pressuring type of way. And I'm not... I'm not really a fan of that. Let's take a look at some of the responses that she had to episode two. The series seems to be trying to build the impression that I was jealous of Juliana. This new episode showed a scene that appeared to be me secretly watching her and Blake walking and talking. But that didn't happen. The footage of me secretly watching them was shot at a different time in a different place. They were cut together to make it look like something happened that never did happen. And it was done to support a dramatic narrative of a story that is pure fiction. This is also a fair point for Teal to make. And again, I'm really glad she brought it up. I'll delve into this when I give my opinions, but I think she has a valid point about how the documentary spent way too much time focusing on personal life and interpersonal drama rather than the work itself and the impact on people. Since this episode once again delved into suicide without much context, let me remind you that based on statistics, the truth is that my methods are more effective at helping those who are potentially suicidal than conventional methods. Oof! Um... Nope! Just, nope, nope! First of all, I want to talk to you about the set. Where the episode takes place. Like the set for any Hollywood movie, this set for this episode is an illusion. While I support intentional community, I myself actually live in an ordinary house with my son, partner, and my personal assistant. In fact, Blake moved into his own apartment nearby in preparation for Juliana's arrival, and so... Surprise, surprise! Juliana, Blake, and I never even lived together. And all the other people I consider part of my community live in their own apartments in the same city. The rolling hills and that mansion they keep showing? It was the location of a week-long completion process training and a week-long curveball retreat. Not my life and not my home. Teal is basically claiming that the documentary kind of outright lied about her, even if it did so through visual implications rather than through explicitly false statements. But I do appreciate that she brought this point up because it honestly does give a lot of context as to why she'd be upset about the series. Episode 3. Same thing happened with my efforts to clarify what my corporation expects from new employees and volunteers. All business entities require their employees to focus on their employer's purpose and mission. Apple's focus is on selling more phones and computers. Google's focus is on generating more advertising revenue. Burger King's focus is on selling more hamburgers. The focus of my corporation, my business, is providing me with the opportunity to share my ideas and my teachings with people who want to learn about my viewpoint and hopefully gain something from that experience. The efforts of my team to shift focus from personal drama that distracts from my mission was depicted as cult activity and not as a business management exercise, not that different from the process major corporations use to draft mission statements for the same reasons. I was hoping she'd address the non-negotiables list. However, I do want to point out that just because something is a business doesn't mean it's not a cult. 
Business and cult are not mutually exclusive. Just look at Dave Ramsey. Actually, I'm glad that lately people are talking a lot more about corporate cults. Teal, as a highly spiritual person, has never struck me as much of a hard capitalist. Although maybe she is, who knows? She is very focused on her brand. But the point is just because something makes money and just because some of the things may be legal in terms of employer-employee guidelines and boundaries, that doesn't mean that it is ethical for a boss to exert that much influence over their employees' lives. While we are on the subject of resistance, this episode made it look like I am a person who forces people to do things. Guess what? Wrong again. I teach free will. I teach that you should never bulldoze resistance because that's a zero-sum game that nobody benefits from. So the reality is, after helping the people at that retreat at length to release their resistance to doing the shamanic work called water breath, anyone who did not want to participate did not have to because they should never force themselves to do something they don't want to do. So at first I thought maybe water breath was just a thing I was ignorant of. I'll be the first to admit guys, I'm not a spiritual person, I'm not religious in any way, I haven't really found any spiritual practices that mesh with me, I'm very literal minded in terms of how I perceive the world, so I don't even fully understand what spirituality is or what a spirit is, so it's entirely possible that this is a legitimate practice that I've never heard of. So I decided to research it. I googled shamanic water breath. Everything that came up was from World of Warcraft. I tried different phrases in Google and instead I found some breathing techniques that you could use for meditation but nothing about breathing in water. So if I'm missing something someone please let me know in the comments below because it's entirely possible. There's another scene with Sabrina that was shown out of context and because of that presents a false narrative. In this scene she says that I told her that her parents don't love her. When I use the word love I use it in a specialized way as a term of art that Sabrina understood. It means that a person takes another person as a part of themselves. It is one of the most difficult things any person can do. Most people cannot do this, which is why they fail to act in the best interests of others. So you admit that your in-group uses language, including words like love, differently than those outside of the in-group. Interesting. Part six, my review of The Deep End. After watching the documentary through twice, taking extensive notes, and watching Teal's response to each episode, I have come to the following conclusion. Teal's defense is pretty weak, but the documentary itself could have done a lot more to not come across as biased as it did. Let's be honest, Teal does have a very strong fan base. A documentary that edits information to show her in the worst possible light isn't going to appeal to her fans. Sure, maybe it'll turn some people away from starting to follow her in the first place, but to her fans it'll just look like a piece of propaganda to be discredited. I don't support misinformation when it's coming from my own side of an issue either. All that does is give the opposition more ammo. Now, that's not to say that the documentary was false in any way. I don't have the rough cuts or the raw footage. I wasn't there. All I know is what I saw on screen and then what Teal said was false. If she was telling the truth and they really did edit together unrelated scenes to make it look like she was mad at Juliana or they really did splice audio together to make unrelated conversations happen that didn't actually play out that way, then yeah, I don't support that. That is not responsible journalism. I also agree with her point that the documentary spent way too much time on their personal stuff. In part one of the video, I talked about how I thought it was awfully judgmental of the documentary to focus so much on Teal living with Blake and their breakup as if that's wrong or immoral in some way. It felt judgmental of non-conventional relationships, which is honestly the same puritanical rhetoric that many prejudiced people use to justify things like homophobia, discrimination against politics, polyamory, the women staying in the kitchen narrative. So I wasn't a fan of the documentary pushing this whole woman versus woman fighting over a man narrative that it tried to do with Teal and Juliana. Teal claims that she and Juliana never had these issues. I have no way to know what the final truth is for sure. But I will say that the whole love triangle narrative was weird and felt like a waste of time. I'd much rather spend that time delving into the feelings of Teal's current and former followers and analysis of the cult elements. We could have spent much more time with Molly the private investigator, for example, or more time seeing the self-help seminars and seeing comparisons to other modern day gurus like Tony Robbins. Additionally, if Teal is telling the truth about the the fact that she lives with her long-term partner and child and that Blake and Juliana lived in an apartment separate from her ever since Juliana arrived in the US, then I do think that the editing of the documentary was kind of manipulative. I was fully under the impression that this group of people, this inner circle, were all living together and not just briefly staying together for a retreat. And again, while I have 
a lot of issues with what Teal is doing, to say the least. That doesn't mean I support the documentary in constructing a narrative that isn't fully true. As I said, all that does is provide ammo to the opposition. All it does is make Teal look like a victim and make the documentary look less credible, which is really a shame because it had a lot of valuable information to share. That said, I don't think the things that Teal does are ethical, even with some of her justifications. And a lot of the stuff shown in the documentary, even in context, even after Teal's explanations, is in my personal opinion, still super unethical. For example, let's take a look at her interactions with Sabrina. Teal insists in her videos that when she and Sabrina are talking about love and whether her parents love her and when she says, I love you after the water exercise, that she's using the word love differently than a layman would. Teal's use of love is contextual. And while all words are contextual, I also do find it a little suspicious that we as outsiders can use a common word like love in the same way and understand what each other means. And Teal and her followers use that word and mean something different. If we look back at the book Cultish, author Amanda Montel, who is a linguist and approaches her study of cults from a linguistic perspective, often points out that manipulated language is the first red flag of a cult, even if not all manipulative language definitively indicates a cult. Basically, by saying that we just didn't understand what she meant by love, Teal is setting up in-group versus out-group language, meaning insiders versus outsiders, one of her own admitted criteria of her being a cult. Similarly, the water thing was terrifying. Guys, I even get stressed playing water levels in video games because it starts to make me like close up and panic. So watching that scene, it was a lot! And if anyone has more information about how the water breath scene may have been deceptively edited as Teal claims, please let me know. Because again, all I could find in my research was World of Warcraft. Maybe Teal is a real life World of Warcraft character. Who knows? This world's weird as hell. Teal's non-negotiables list, even in the context of it being an agreement between boss and employee, is still overbearing in my opinion. Last year around this time, I did a Deep Dave series on Dave Ramsey where I made three videos talking about the way he runs his finance company. Well, I don't think we can definitively say that Dave Ramsey is a cult leader, I do think his company is one that exemplifies what it means to have too much reach into your employees' personal lives. In that series, I interviewed a former employee of Dave's who talked about some of his weirdest rules, including men and women not being allowed to ride in cars together and him prohibiting employees from living with their significant others before marriage. Dave even got sued by a former employee who was fired from the company because she got pregnant out of wedlock, which Dave claims goes against his Christian values that every everyone working for him must follow. This is all to say that just because Teal is claiming that these are her boundaries as a boss and her vision for a company doesn't mean that it's reasonable that she expects her employees to make their work for her infiltrate every element of their lives. It's okay for work to be work and personal life to be separate. At the very least, this told me that Teal is an overbearing boss and a terrible employer. Part 7. Conclusion. Is it a cult? As I've mentioned multiple times in this video, it's hard to claim definitively whether something is completely a cult or completely not a cult. However, in this case, I personally believe, in my personal opinion, based on the research that I've done, that yeah, Teal Swan definitely exists somewhere on the cult leader spectrum. She may not be Jim Jones, but then again, most other cult leaders aren't Jim Jones either. As Amanda Montel pointed out, even Jim Jones himself was considered an extreme example among other cult leaders. But Teal has definitely displayed behavior that sets off some alarm bells. It can be easy to find ways to justify her tactics. For example, one of my main issues with Teal is that she practices therapy without a license. But for many of Teal's followers, this may not be a bad thing, as many of them report having found Teal after the mainstream therapy and psychology fields had failed them. Plus, for those who aren't attending her expensive retreats, reading one of her self-help books or watching her videos for free online is a lot more affordable and accessible than attending therapy sessions, especially if you don't have health insurance. So it's kind of short-sighted to say, just go to therapy, don't listen to Teal, because there's a reason these followers have chosen Teal instead of therapy in the first place. The solution is to guarantee health insurance for all citizens, which includes mental health services. The solution is also more education about the process of finding the right therapist for you, including ways to identify a good therapist and education about the process of trying out different therapists until you find one who works for your needs. So, is Teal Swan a cult leader? Well, she may have not reached the bottom of the deep end yet, but she is definitely in the pool. And I would advise people to exercise extreme caution when following Teal and others like her. 
Thank you so much for watching today's video. I will see you guys again next week, but in the meantime, please continue supporting small businesses. Do not support Teal Swan and have a fantastic start to your weekend. Bye. Hit you some nuts. There was lots of memes. Makes me wonder if I should pick up lesbianism. Chicago. You guys asked for it.